talk about one of the techniques that I said the first day that is one of the predominant one of the most, uh, most interesting techniques now for, for neuroscience in general and for drug addiction in particular that is optogenetic. Today we will have two uh, talks that will be focused on this, uh, on this particular technique, Travis and, and all of also Cyril Herring, <laughs> that will talk also from a different perspective about this very important thing. So, okay, thanks. Great, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, I'm probably just gonna stand, it makes me more comfortable. Um, so, I'm Lex Kravitz, um, uh, come from Washington, D.C. I'm um, sort of appointed in two institutes, NIDDK, um, which for, it's a kind of little bit of a strange in the neuroscience field, um, but it's di diabetes, digestive, and kidney diseases, and then NIDA that um, you all know. So my research was, is um, on sort of the reason that uh, my home is in NIDK. My research is on obesity and sort of the food addiction side of things. Um, although most of what I'm going to talk about here um, is not my own research, and it's also um, not about obesity. It's going to be about drug addiction. So what I think of the genetics, um, really does and it does well is look at certain features of a model. So often diseases will affect a lot of the brain or a lot of the body. And you study a, a disease model of you know this protein's up, this protein's down. You're looking at an animal that has changes in many, many circuits and many systems throughout the body. And I think what optogenetics really does well is tease apart one specific feature. So I'm starting with the definition of addiction that I like because it breaks it into three. And I know there's lots of definitions of addiction. Um, each with their merits, but what this is getting at, this is a definition from Kub and Volkoff, that addiction can be characterized by three things. There's a compulsion to take drugs, there's the loss of control and limiting intake, and then there's an emergence of a negative emotional state that always is associated with addiction and often is thought to sort of drive the addiction. People are escaping from this negative state. And the way that I've framed this talk is I'm going to talk about research um, kind of in each of these three things and frame it as, you know, which systems are dealing with the compulsion, which systems are dealing with the negative emotional state, and which systems are dealing with the, the loss of um, inhibitory control. And I'm trying to give sort of a survey of what's been done in the optogenetic space um, with each of these, and really with addiction, trying to cover a lot of things. I should also mention that um, feel free to raise your hand or just shout out um, if you want. You know, if you want to ask questions while we're going, that would be much better than waiting till the end. Um, so I'm going to have three parts of this. The first two are going to be kind of quick. The first, um, I'm coming up at this with an assumption that uh, we don't have to go over tranoidopsin and how it opens and all of that, um, that we all. So certainly ask questions if um, I move through this quickly. But I'm going to try to talk about optogenetics briefly um, and focus just kind of on how many different variants of these opsins there are, um, not to be exhaustive, but just give an idea that you know if, if there's something that you're thinking of is probably, there may be an option that kind of does that already. I'm also going to talk a little bit about dreads. These are designer receptors, um, very complementary techniques to chenorodopsin. Um, and then also expression systems, basically just one I'm going to bring up that accounts for 99% of the way that people are expressing these, um, in mice at least, is the pre lox recombination. <laughs> I'm then going to talk about these three symptoms that I brought up before, the compulsion, the um, inhibitory control problems, and the negative emotional state in terms of circuits. So start to think about breaking addiction symptoms into circuits that then you can express options in and start to manipulate. And then uh, for the most of the talk, I'm going to go through what's been done in two systems. And this, again, is not exhaustive. Um, there's more beyond the basal ganglia and the cortex um, that I'm not getting into, uh, mainly because um, maybe I'm trying to focus on the optogenetic studies and the ones that there's enough of the literature to sort of bring up to these, but I don't mean to give a um, <coughs> To neglect um, other systems that are involved. So, uh, for let's see, let's see if I can see it over here, maybe a little easier. Um, so, opsins are similar to the opsins in our, in our retina that confer light into electrical activity there. They're membrane bound proteins, they incorporate retinol and called a conformational change in the protein. Um, it can be a GPCR, I think that's what. Um, no, we're, showing, we're seeing ion channel here. They can be ion channels, they can be GPCRs, like the ones in the retina. And there's really been three um, main classes of them that have been worked on. There's the channel which is 
probably 90% of the published literature is even with one specific one channel rhodopsin 2. Um, and these are <laughs> life-sensitive ion channels. There's pumps which have been used to inhibit neurons, hyperpolarize them, and mainly haloridopsin and archeridopsin, the chloride pump and the proton pump. And then something that's getting a little more, um, it was actually first published one of the earlier papers, um, I believe it was 2007, um, the light-sensitive DPCR. Um, and it seems great. It seems like it would be a very useful thing that you know, basically mimicking DPCR signaling, um, but you can do it in a gentle, least precise way. It's really only until this year that I think the second or third paper on these has been um, gaining traction. Um, but the idea there is if you're interested in the dopamine D1 receptor, you can have that, literally that intracellular side of that receptor on a light-sensitive um, protein, and then instead of applying a drug and watching an animal for hours, you can turn on the light for milliseconds or seconds and see what happens when, um, when that signaling gets turned on. Um, I believe all these slides also are, um, I'm going to leave a copy, so um, I believe you'll be able to get. But I made a chart here just sort of to infer the breadth of them, um, not to be, also again, not exhaustive. There's many more that I'm not putting on here. But kind of, we have the cation channels, we have these pumps that are inhibitory. Um, there's another form of pumps. These are chloride um, channels or pumps. There's also protons. You can pump hydrogen out of the cell and hyperpolarize it that way, pumping positive charges out. And then I mentioned this, um, the, the first paper called them OptoXRs. Um, they're light-sensitive GPCRs. And the first ones were these adrenergic receptors. But since then, there's been a serotonin receptor, a dopamine D1 receptor, and a, a new, opi new opioid receptor um, that have all been, they're light sensitive. I put some links here. Um, this is a Dice Rock Lab website that has the sequence info and everything that they've developed, which is, which is a lot. It's um, probably a good chunk of everything that has been developed has come out of that lab. Um, and then these are two viral cores that sell this stuff. Um, and we were talking earlier about this, of just sort of how cheap optogenetics has gotten to set up um, to, you know, like I don't make viruses, um, we just buy them, it's $200 an aliquot, and if you want one of these, you know, something new gets published, usually it'll be the 10 or UNC vector core will start making it, so um, it's really, a, I think the, the field is mature enough that you can kind of like, you can get into it and do it cheaply, and most of the hard work's getting done for us, frankly. One more slide on the tools, um, again, to sort of confer the breadth. Um, this is a slide from a tie in Dicerath review. I kind of like what we've got on the um, x axis is uh, um, the time constant of how quickly these channels or pumps, how quickly they turn on and turn off. And on the y axis, we've got the peak activation spectra. So something, where's channel redoxin 2 should be. These one, this H134R is the one that's most commonly used. They're all sort of point mutations of the chenoridopsin, um, too, that mm -hmm. confer some different functionality. Um, but that's something that turns on not extremely quickly, so on the scale of 10 milliseconds. Um, so you see sort of, sometimes you'll see like electrophysiolo electrophysiological studies and things. You know, cells may not turn on millisecond right when they are, which can make some sense with the physical properties of this. But then they've gone ahead and mutated it in several other ways and gotten some that are very, very fast, really down to one or two milliseconds. And then if we look out the other way, this is the original channel redoxin chain, sorry, this is which um, comes out of a bacteria, or uh, not, not a bacteria, a little algae thing. Um, but this is the, the sort of nature's version of it. And then the one that everyone's using is the, in the first paper, they mutated it here to bring, um, make it faster. But there's obviously a benefits to having some, you know, some experiments you may want something that's millisecond precise if you're going to study some spike timing dependent thing. In other manipulations, there's versions of it that really are out 30 minutes. Um, one pulse of light, the channel opens, and it will stay open with a time constant of about 30 minutes to close. So you could do like a very long manipulation without delivering 30 minutes of laser stimulation to the brain. On the y-axis here, we're also looking at the um, activation peak activation spectra. And what this is getting at, um, and it becomes kind of interesting, is um, it, we haven't really gotten to the point where people are doing multi-channel control. If you want to think about GFP and YFP and RFP, if that is sort of an analogy, that GFP is great, you can visualize neurons, but it's 
really nice to also have a red channel and a green channel and a far red channel. And that hasn't happened really with the, with the options yet. It's been sort of, it's getting there. And certainly the proof of principle is there that <coughs> you can have like C1, V1 is an, an excitatory option. It passes all the same cards as generate option two, but it's red shifted. So theoretically, you could express C1, V1 in one group of neurons, generate option in another group of neurons, and then have two channels of control over two separate populations. Um, I'll mention that really hasn't been, other than the proof of principle, nobody's done, done that in a useful way yet, or at least not published it. Um, Often these activation spectra, they're not, you know, they're like GFP or all the fluorophores as an analogy. There's been so much time and so many, so much work on them that their activation spectra can be very sharp. So you can have something that's really activated at one frequency and you go 50 millimeters faster or slower and it's no longer activated. Most of these are still pretty broad. So it's activated, you know, most specifically at 470, but if you do 500 or 550, you're still going to get some photocurrent. So that's off, I think that's really the technical issue that's going to get solved to make the, you know, the dual channel control happen. Um, I just have, sorry, there, I'm going to move off the tools of optogenetics if that's, we're all kind of up to speed on with these things. The other technique that's going to be um, used in the papers I'm going to talk about are DREAD receptors. This stands for designer receptor activated exclusively by designer drugs. Um, it's a little unfortunate that the acronym is so long, but that seems like that's what's Sticking with. So here's two. Um, this is a GQ. It's an excitatory drug. The way these were made, um, these are actually the second generation, um, but they're sort of uh, the first generation that works really well. These were made by mutating a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor and going through and mutating it until it no longer responded to acetylcholine. So we removed that and instead started responding to this um, inert synthetic compound, clozapine N-oxide, or CNO for short. So there's a muscarinic, human muscarinic 3DQ is an excitatory GQ coupled receptor. They mutated it so it no longer responds to acetylcholine, now responds to CNO. Um, HM4DI is human muscarinic 4, it's a GI coupled receptor, an inhibitory receptor that they did the same set of mutations. So no longer responds to acetylcholine, but responds to clozapine and N oxide. And the beauty of this system now is that you have a receptor that if you express, there's no, it doesn't respond to acetylcholine. It doesn't, theoretically shouldn't do anything. Um, there may be a little bit of constitutive activity, but really it's pretty inert if you just express it. On the other side of things, you have a drug, CNO, that is also <coughs> inert. So you can inject, inject it in wild type mice. It doesn't bind anywhere. It doesn't affect their behavior. It doesn't do anything. But if you have a mouse that you've expressed the dread and you inject CNO, you have you know, reversible um, cell types, cell type specific control of either GQ or GI signals. <coughs> um, relatively recently, there's also been uh, similar things happened with the GS coupled receptor. So they um, can also have an excitatory GS coupled receptor. And I'll mention even more um, recently, there's work on other um, sort of like channel write ops that I mentioned, the getting into multiple channels of control. Um, the original generation of these was done off the kappa opioid receptor. Um, same kind of same model, but the mutated cell no longer responds to opiates, but responds um, to synthetic kappa opiates. And that one had some problems, the, the first versions, but now I understand they were getting um, as good as the CNO. So you could have two channels of control where you have one set of populations being controlled by CNO and the other set being controlled by a kappa opioid. The last thing I'm going to talk about is expression systems. So um, the power of this is often in getting cell type specific control, or that, that really is the power of doing these manipulations. Um, that within a heterogeneous cell um, structure, you can target one specific cell type. And the way that, basically the way that um, everyone's done this to express, there's a couple other, um, this is a pre-lock system I'm going to mention here. Um, there's also a flip system, but it's the same concept. Is that you have a mouse that expresses Cree, you inject a virus or use a transgenic animal, that expresses the, this is an example I'm giving is the, uh, the GQ dread. It, this part here could be channel rhodopsin, it could be halo rhodopsin or anything with the same um, sort of flanking regions. And it has a, a pair of non homologous LOX P sites. So what these will do, if an animal expresses Cree, and that's where the cell type specificity comes in, in the presence of Cree, we'll take this um, code, the reading frame region, the part that, <coughs> that codes the protein, flip it around and then excise one set of these 
locks piece sites. So it gets stuck in that confirmation. So you can inject a virus or have an animal that normally this is backwards um, and won't get translated into a functional protein. But in the presence of pre, only in those cells that have pre, it'll turn into a functional protein. Um, so I have a cute little animation of this. So here's an example of if we're doing TH cre, if you're trying to target dopamine neurons, only some of these neurons are dopamine neurons go into the midbrain, and only some of them in, in a TH cre rat. All the ones that have TH will have cre. You can inject some of the pre-specific virus. Only those dopamine neurons will start to express whatever is in the virus. In this case, this GQ dread. And then you put CNO for the dread or light for generinopsin, and just those cells are activated, sparing the others. I'll mention something um, which I think is it's relevant to generinopsin. It's also relevant to dreads. That you spare them from the direct actions, but they're still in a circuit where half of their friends have just been activated by either by light or by a drug. So it's not quite um, fair to say that these cells are just hanging out, doing exactly what they were doing before the CNO manipulation. They're going to get um, you know, the effects of what happens when you stimulate dopamine. Quick question for how, why, in this case, TH3 and um, all these cells would be expressed in So the question is, uh, what percentage of cells, if you do the viral injection, what percentage expresses? Um, this has actually been not well quantified. In, uh, I'll give you sort of my hunch on it, um, and I can tell you the reason it hasn't been so well quantified. My hunch is that it's, it depends on the injection, but it can be almost all of them, or when you have, sometimes you have a bad injection and you see there's you know, a small amount of virus went in and you may have a few scattered cells. Um, but I think if you get a good injection, it's almost all of them. Um, the reason that it really, the way to the reason it hasn't been well quantified is generidopsin's a membrane protein. And so often when you, you know, cut slices and you want to say, let's count up all the positive cells, if it was cytosolic, you'd see the, you know, count all the green cells and then you'll know how many of them um, express. In many brain structures, there's, it's membrane and it's just sort of a meshwork that you cut the structures, like I'm going to show you data from the striatum. And this was something that we really um, tried to get at in a few ways. But couldn't really couldn't use the channel option itself to, for the purposes of quantifying because it's just the whole thing is membrane. Okay, but one more. Uh, <coughs> is there any knowledge if there's a preference for dendritics or axons or cell bodies or channel ah. options <coughs> everywhere? So yeah, so the question is if the channel option is any preferentially targeted to cell bodies or axons or dendrites. Um, there are variants of it that have been developed that specifically target, specifically target axons. I'm not sure if there's ones that target dendrites. Um, but the sort of run-of-the-mill one, um, that E134R, is, uh, I think it's expressed on membrane, and it doesn't have any specificity. But people have made ones that go you know, just to axon terminals or something, which, depending on your experiment, you can kind of dream up why that would be helpful in some preparations. With the, with the dreadry sector, uh, how much expression do you have? I mean, you can you can uh, be confident that this is a physiological response, or or you are activating like a bomb there. Ah, so the, I think the question is uh, not so much the expression because that's going to be the virus, and that'll depend on how the virus injection and everything. But whether you're getting a physiological response yeah. when you turn it on. Yeah. Um, no, definitely not. I would say <laughs> so. So in the the question is, you know, you, you turn on, you put CNO, CNO on these, or we shine a light. Is it a physiological? Is that the same as when the animal fires dopamine, um, or when those neurons fire during behavior when they're getting stimulated by behavior? And I think it's it's almost certainly stimulating them much more strongly. Um, as a result, you get much more stronger behaviors. So um, I'm going to show you some videos of reinforcement behavior, but we've been uh, doing a lot with movement, and you get, I mean, really super physiological effects on movement because we're, this is with light, we're stimulating them really strongly. I think that topic is pretty, is also something to keep in mind and really interesting that um, it's a good place to start to say that a system is capable of producing this behavior. So you can stimulate it however you want or as hard as you want. And if you get the behavior, at least you can say the system is capable of it. But then the question of does this system, is this what it normally does? Does it normally produce this behavior? You then have to be a little trickier and probably go in and record in some way and then use the recordings to tune your stimulation to try to get you know within physiological ranges. And that's starting to happen. But 
I think the whole first wave of optogenetics was stimulate as hard as you can and try to get a behavior out. I know people that have had problems with like decree driver lines not being as specific as you would hope. Do you think there's like a, a threshold level of specificity for the expression that you would aim for? Or so the, you know, the questions on the decree driver lines and how specific they are. I, I mean, you need it specific enough for your question. Um, they definitely are specific, and there are ones which are specific enough. Like we use these striatal lines, and they're very specific. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, it's going to depend on where there's great. One other, this is not your question, but I'll just mention one other point that comes up with the specificity is if you're, if you're doing a viral method, you have pre where the pre exists in an adult animal. Um, if you're doing a transgenic method, if you cross in like a channel rhodopsin, um, channel rhodopsin reporter mouse, so now you just cross the two mice together and channel rhodopsin should show up wherever there's pre. They'll actually show up wherever there was pre ever in development. So that can cause a problem if you don't know when Cree is turning on in development, and maybe it was there in, you know, embryonic, but now it's gone in the adult, and you're confused about why you have channel rhodopsin in some cell population that isn't, doesn't have Cree in the adult. That could be a thing. Um, so that's sort of the intro to the tools. I did move kind of quickly. I kind of had a move with an assumption that we're um, all sort of up to speed, general options, light driven stuff, threads are the um, injecting CNL. <coughs> um, I'm now going to talk about breaking these three symptoms that I brought up into circuits and then um, spend most of the talk really talking about these circuits um, and only two big um, literature, basal ganglia and cortex, which have been um, sort of substantially researched in addiction, um, with, or with, with optogenetics, I'll say. So to give some uh, idea of the complexity and um, the oversimplification I'm doing to focus just on two circuits. Um, this is a slide from Edwards and Kube that's just kind of getting at them. A bunch of things I'm not going to talk about. Um, hypothalamus, amygdala, not that, you know, obviously their role in addiction. Um, but yeah, just kind of put this up to get at the, com the complexity of things and recognize the oversimplification I'm going to make. And really what I'm going to talk about are um, three main cell populations, dopamine neurons and cells that project up to the striatum um, and also the prefrontal cortex, the striatum which receives dopamine and has two populations of output neurons, and then cortex which projects to many places but um, a lot of its addiction effects may be through its cortical striatal <coughs> projections. So these um, slides are, I'm going to start with the projections in the striatum and we'll actually first start um, with these studies that have been done in the striatum. These are slides from Chip Gerf, and um, what he's done here is express virally um, use a virus which targets the fluorophores, red and green. We'll see them in a second. Um, one to one population of cells, and the other, and another to the other cells. There's sorry, I should have said there's two and only two projection, two populations of neurons in this right end. So, 95% of the cells are medium spiny neurons, which come in two different um, flavors. About 5% of the cells are interneurons. But in this, he's put a virus in that targets a red fluorescent protein to one population of medium spiny neurons and a green fluorescent protein to the other. So, pause this. So we can just see here is this virus, um, it is targeting the two, and really if you, you might want to take my word for this because of the colors, but there's really no cells that express both. Cells are either red or they're green. So they differ um, in several ways, which we'll get to. The most um, common and maybe the most relevant, commonly cited and maybe the most relevant is they have different dopamine receptors. So dopamine itself has a different effect um, on each population um, because of that. They also differ in their projection targets. So now we're looking at this. I'm going to show you sequential slices <coughs> going backwards through the brain. Um, so that we can see sort of, we can see their projection, the differences in the projection targets. And I think this is one of the nicest demonstrations I saw of this. As we're going backwards, first you see these green fibers. They come out of the striatum, and they're synapsing a structure just behind the striatum, the globus pallidus. And if we keep going with it, the red fibers go around the globus pallidus, and then they keep going. We're going all the way to the back of the brain now, um, to the substantia nigra, that one of the midbrain nuclei that makes dopamine. 
although these fibers are synapsing on GABAergic cells there in the reticulata. If we put all of these slices together um, into a 3D reconstruction, you can see the injection sites in the striatum. You see fibers coming just behind the striatum to the lobus pallidus, and then the direct pathway fibers going all the way down to the nigra. Um, it's pretty amazing in the sense that they're going almost a centimeter. These little cell bodies are sending their projections right across the brain. Um, I'll go through the, the circuitry in one other way, sort of more boxes and arrows in the next slide, but this is known as the direct pathway, and I'm going to abbreviate it as DMSN, direct pathway medium spiny neuron. And then these are the indirect pathway, I'm going to abbreviate IMSN, indirect pathway medium spiny neuron, um, by virtue of how they get to the nigra. So I'll show you this here, this being the direct pathway, this is the indirect. Um, this is sort of the simplest basal ganglia model, been proposed since the late 1980s. Um, and it more or less, it's missing a lot of, of lines here, but it more or less covers the main um, excitatory and inhibitory projections through the basal ganglia. So if we focus on these, these are those cells that went all the way across the direct path to median spiny neurons. Median spiny neurons are GABAergic, so they're inhibitory cells, and these guys went all the way across the brain to inhibit another population of GABAergic neurons in the nigra. So when they fire, we inhibit the nigra. The nigra projects, to, um, mainly it's, it's sort of the output of, of motor behavior. So it's projecting back to thalamus and cortex. When these neurons fire, it releases them from inhibition. And then in a very broad way, I'm just going to say this will facilitate motor programs. And it'll facilitate specific motor programs depending on the specific activation of direct pathway neurons. Um, but this is a, sort of a schematic. If we bring back the indirect pathway, you can do the math here, but it's essentially the opposite, that you have the same release from inhibition that's happening on the subthalamic nucleus, which is an excitatory structure. This will actually excite the nigra, inhibit thalamal cortex, inhibiting motor programs. So these are opposing populations. Direct pathway promotes movement, or promotes the selection of motor programs. Indirect pathway inhibits movement and inhibits um, activation of motor programs. One more uh, population, I'm gonna, one more thing to add to this are dopamine itself. So in the nigra, in the um, compacta, we have a population of dopamine neurons that project back up to the striatum. And I had alluded to this, but these guys have a different dopamine receptor. The direct pathway neuron, mean and spiny neurons have a D1. This is a GS coupled GPCR, so it's an excitatory receptor. And in this way, dopamine can excite the direct pathway neurons and therefore promote specific motor programs by exciting them. Um, as dopamine does. The indirect pathway neurons have the dopamine D2 <coughs> receptor. It's a GI coupled receptor. So therefore, dopamine can inhibit the, in, inhibit the inhibitory pathway and or facilitate motor, powder, motor programs in that way, taking off the brain, <coughs> essentially. So if I go back to this hypothesis about addiction, um, I think we can also bring the lights up too, but I don't, I don't have any more um, fluorescent stuff. So what I'm going to present and kind of frame this um, talk in is thinking about these three symptoms, or three big groups of symptoms, in terms of this circuitry. And really what I'm going to get at is that the direct pathway and plasticity and adaptations there may be most likely responsible for the compulsive act aspects of drugs of abuse. The prefrontal cortex is in position to provide inhibitory <laughs> control. So dysfunction there may relate to the loss of inhibitory control. And then the indirect pathway, um, I believe this, um, I keep saying the same thing, but I'm uh, being a little simplistic here. I believe there's a lot more involved in the, in the negative emotional states, but I'm going to present a case that the indirect pathway through the basal ganglia um, dysfunctions and a specific type of dysfunction there may be contributing to this negative emotional state. So uh, first I'm going to talk about uh, direct pathway studies that have been done with optogenetics. Um, looking at reinforcement and its role in its relationship to compulsion. So bringing up the definition of compulsion, you have this, I'm gonna actually stick with number two, but we have the, the action or state of forcing or being forced to do something, an irresistible urge to behave in a certain way, especially against one's unconscious wishes. So that aspect of it, the behavior that's sort of forced against conscious wishes, is reminiscent to me of um, the, the behavioral literature on reinforcement. So talk about reinforcement, 
this is a nice way of getting around a, a lot of problems that behaviorists were dealing with um, in the 50s and 60s of, you know, does an animal want to do this? Does an animal like this, dislike this? And behaviorists came up with a solution that has its own logic, which is that, you know, you don't know what an animal wants to do or is feeling, but we can observe its behavior. Um, sort of take the conscious control out of it and just say, you know, if, an an if you've done something that increases a behavior, whether the animal likes it or not, that's reinforcement if you've added a stimulus that increases the behavior. And because you're adding a stimulus, you'd call it positive reinforcement. If you take away a stimulus and increase a behavior, um, a common example of this is like, like the seatbelt beeping in your car. So that's a stimulus that will increase a behavior by take, to take it away, that you want to turn that, that beeping off so you have learned to turn, put on your seatbelt. It's an example of negative reinforcement. And then the, same, the flip side to this um, is the term punishment. So this is, punishment is unfortunately has a lot of meanings um, sort of in our everyday language. Um, and it makes it a little confusing that you feel like the animal's getting punished or he's not happy or something. Um, but in the behavioral literature, it's just the opposite of reinforcement. If you add a stimulus that decreases the behavior, it's, pun it's positive punishment if you've added a stimulus. Just if you put chalk the mouse and now he doesn't press the lever, you've added a, a punishing stimulus. Or negative is if you've removed the stimulus, like you're not, you're not being nice, so I'm taking away your toys, that kind of thing, so you can remove the behavior. I'm going to um, talk to you about the direct pathway and its role in reinforcement. And essentially, uh, that we can examine positive reinforcement with optogenetics in a pretty simple operant task. So in this task, um, this mouse is placed in a, this is a work that I did in Anatole Kreitzer's lab, my postdoc. Um, but we put a mouse in a box where he had two triggers. One of them, if he touched it, it's just basically an intracranial self-stimulation paradigm. One of them, he touches it, and he gets a one second burst of light that activates the direct pathway. The other one, it just counts how many, you know, just to get an idea of how much he's touching the triggers. I'm going to show you a video. Um, it's sped up tenfold, but what we're looking at actually is, at this point right now, this mouse is naive. So we're looking at the very beginning of his first day of training. So this is a mouse, he's, you know, he's curious, he's exploring these triggers. And you see when he touches this one, he gets a burst. I don't have the clock on here, but we're probably at about four minutes right now. Um, by about 10 minutes, it becomes pretty clear that this mouse has figured something out in the, about the stimulation. So every time he touches this, he gets one second laser pulse that's stimulating the direct pathway. So if we, if we uh, show this quantitatively, this is what we are watching about the first 10 minutes of one mouse on this. But here I'm presenting the percent of laser-triggered contacts. So if he was up here at 100%, it would mean that all of his contacts were to the laser trigger. If he was down here at zero, it would mean none of his contacts were um, to the laser. We see that um, overall the group starts out at 50%. And then over 30 minutes, so we did three 30-minute sessions. Over 30 minutes, he, they, as a group, learned to contact more the direct the stimulation trigger. Something interesting is you bring them back on day two, and they remember it right away, um, and then the same on day three, that they don't have to relearn this. Um, we really haven't pushed this to see how far, you know, how far can you take this reinforcement. If we did something like long-access cocaine um, self-administration, something like six hours a day, you know, where would, how far would we get them? Um, the only thing I can say that we've done um, with this is send them home uh, to test how long are these memories. And you can send them home for three weeks back to the colony and bring them back and they remember. Um, so it's some type of, it's a long lasting plasticity that's happening. Did, did the, the discrimination improve over the days? Because if you compare, for instance, with the uh, intravenous self administration, you have uh, uh, around 80% of discrimination between the active and the, and the inactive level. Or here you, over the days, you have a better discrimination? Yeah, so, th um, so this is, I mean, this kind of gets at the discrimination, the percent of the total total triggers that is paired with the laser. So on the first day, the discrimination goes up. Um, and then we're, yeah, it, it's, it improves. Mm. But 
of it remains for our 25 percent more in. Well, so that's, I don't think we, we've done three, here I'm showing three 30 minute sessions. And um, yeah, I think we really should push it a lot further to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So another way um, you can do this is, uh, and this has been a very, it's a behavior that actually was sort of invented with optogenetics. And it's been very useful in, uh, in getting, a, it's an operant behavior, but it's useful because of its or gross nature. So this is something that people have been calling real-time place preference. It's not conditioned place preference because often there's not a conditioning test even done. It's real-time place preference. It's an operant behavior. So an animal's in a chamber with two sides. When he goes to one side, a laser turns on. It may be that it does pulses. It may be that it stays on constantly. Um, however, the sort of, it's getting at that question about physio physiology. It's often, however, the experimenters kind of set it up. Um, to get the behavior, but what you can do here is he's free to go back and forth, turn the laser on whenever he wants, and you can see where does he prefer um, to spend his time, either you know getting stimulation or not getting stimulation. And I think it's been really nice because it's a it's a very simple task. The animal has to be on one side or the other, so it's not like nose poking or lever pressing, where sometimes some animals just don't pick it up. You spend a lot of time training them just to get them to understand that this you know, lever does something. Um, and when we did this with these, uh, this is a different group of mice, but the same preparation. You see the same thing that we saw. You know, here's with him touching the triggers, the per number of triggers. Here's the percent time on the illuminated side. Same exact thing, that over 30 minutes, they learn that if they go onto one side, they get simulation. Um, and then they remember it if you bring them back. We also did a conditioning test. So a conditioning test, you turn off the laser, and you see, you know, do you, you want to hang out where you used to get stimulation? Um, and for the direct pathway, they also condition to it. This is bilateral, right? Yeah. And both the delivery and the stimulation is bilateral. Yeah. So, uh, so the question was the um, bilateral, was it bilateral stimulation? So yeah, so all of these are, I should also mention, these are um, in the dorsal medial striatum. So it's a bilateral injection of a virus expressing channel rhodopsin in direct pathway neuron and bilateral fiber optics. Sorry, just to give you one more detail, even though you're not asking me. This also will work with unilateral. So the uni unilateral will cause movement, so they'll or rotate, but they'll learn to self-stimulate to get unilateral stimulation as well. Is it the same type of stimulation as in the repressing one, or is it the second it crossed that is like a continuous thing as long as you're So the way that we did this one, and I'll, um, so that, yeah, it's, it's actually not, it's, it's similar though. This one was uh, one second every time they pulsed it, one second of constant light. Um, I think th this whole topic that maybe we're sort of getting into of you know, how to, what's the stimulation parameters is very, very interesting. And often, you know, if you even look in the striatal literature at what people have been using to do reinforcement, it's all over the place. This is one milliwatt of constant stimulation. Some of the papers I'm going to show um, actually didn't. Um, I'll see if it, what I remember off the top of my head what, what their stimulation parameters are, but I know at least one of them I, I'm going to show is 20 milliwatts <coughs> of 20 hertz stimulation. So, it's, so you're studying both studying the and both studying reinforcement, but whether <coughs> one is more or less physiological, I think that's a parameter space that hasn't been well studied and probably will get more, better studied because it's also something like dopamine. You know, that's it's not a linear. That's has a well-known non-linear response with reinforcement that. It, some level it's reinforcing. If you go too high, something like cocaine is reinforcing in one dose range. Above that, it actually becomes punishing. So I think it's likely that a lot of these circuits have effects that are not linear. It's not just more stimulation, more, more of the behavior. They may have a nonlinear response that people are picking up different behaviors at different parts of that response. Um, sorry, so th this stimulation was, to, uh, every time he went on, it was for two seconds, and then it stayed <coughs> off for eight seconds. The reason that we ended up with this, I'll, uh, I'm going to get into the indirect pathway in a little bit, um, but the indirect pathway will actually freeze the mice. So when they get the stimulation, they'll, you know, they'll just they can't move. And when we first set this up, we set it up so that they go on one side, and we just left it on constantly, so the mouse can just turn it on, and it would stay on as long as he's there. And with the indirect pathway mice, this turned out that they would go there once and get frozen, and then you sit there wondering how long you're going to run experiment. Um, so we realized we had to give the indirect pathway mice a chance to escape if they were, you know, to see which side they wanted to hang out on. 
Um, so we use that same parameter. And stuff. Um, you can do this with constant, I guess, but that, the reason we came up with two seconds was with the <coughs> DNA <coughs> well, I mentioned that these SNPs, so what you learn here is that simulating postsynaptically depolarizing and simulating these direct pathway neurons is sufficient for reinforcement, and it's actually sufficient to cause some plasticity that's long-lasting um, in these neurons. So I'm going to now go through a, several other papers on the direct pathway, all kind of hammering into this point that direct pathway neurons, if they're stimulated, it's reinforcing. It can modulate the reinforcing properties of drugs of abuse as well. So this is a paper um, Mary Kate Lobo and colleagues published in 2010. The way they did this, they were she was doing cocaine place preference. So this is typical, you know, what you pair him on one side of the box with an injection of cocaine, on the other side with an injection of saline. We do three pairings like across days. And then you put him in the box and see which side this is time in the cocaine slash blue light chamber over time in the saline no light chamber. Um, so what they did here was when they do the cocaine injections, they also delivered blue light to the direct pathway. Um, this is using a D1 cre, so dopamine receptor 1 um, cre mouse. They used a, this is a little bit funny. I think in light of what I just showed you, there's, some, there's another interpretation here. But this is a, a dose of cocaine that actually didn't produce any condition place preference. Um, but when paired with blue light, it did. So the conclusion here is that the blue light was sufficient to increase the reinforcing properties of cocaine. I think it's possible, um, it's not exactly the same experiment, but it's possible that this has nothing to do with the cocaine in this specific experiment. This cocaine doesn't do anything to animals with alpha light, but this is, you know, she's, this is looking at the reinforcing properties of stimulating the direct pathway on its own. But she's going to get at the, there's more in this paper that gets at it. Um, Again, with the cocaine, um, this is now using a dread and looking at inhibition. I think dreads are they're really nice with inhibition, especially for drug behaviors that maybe the you know, whole behavior is a long-lasting thing, the time that the animal's on cocaine. So here, what we're looking at are four lines. Um, two of them are getting saline. Um, but the top line is an animal that's getting, he has a virus that's just expressing a fluorophore, so no active, oh, I'm sorry, this has been done with the dread. I'm showing a, an a optogenetic. Um, response here as well. This was done by Susan Ferguson a few years earlier with the dread. I think this data is just a little bit um, prettier, so I went with this one for the demonstration. But so this one, there's uh, haloridopsin. This is that inhibitory chloride pump. And the expressive virus either has haloridopsin with the YFP or just the YFP. So in this way, the animal still gets the fiber optics, still gets the expression of the virus, still has a fluorophore, but there's no chloride pump in there. If we look at the this line here, we're seeing animals injected with cocaine and just the distance traveled in a uh, square arena. And we see that you keep giving the same injection of cocaine and there's a sensitization, a locomotor sensitization response that the animal starts moving more and more across the days. If while you give the cocaine, you're inhibiting um, the direct pathway, it impairs this locomotor sensitization. And then these are the saline groups that I go. Um, so this is a paper uh, um, coming from William Yang's group, where it's kind of neat. They, they made a, they're showing that the um, direct pathway neurons, and specifically opiate receptors on them, are sufficient for the reinforcing properties of opiates. So here's a normal mouse, and this is again using condition place preference. So we have saline, you know, doesn't cause any conditioning when they do injections of saline on both sides. Do injections of morphine and they get a condition place preference. They then made a morphine, a mu opiate receptor knockout mouse. This is a knockout everywhere, and this mouse does not have a condition place preference for morphine. They made a mouse that's promoting uh, the mu opiate receptor off of the pedine is uh, also another way of targeting the direct pathway neurons. This is a, pre a dynorphin receptor, it's one of the peptides that um, the direct pathway neurons make. Um, this mouse alone, so this mouse actually is, uh, um, it's basically normal. It's expressing some, probably some extra new opioid receptors in the direct pathway, but still has all of its others. And it has a normal um, morphine place preference. But then when they cross these two together, the, the knockout and this pedine, so now they have a mouse that only has new opioid receptors in the direct pathway. So it's missing them everywhere else, um, just in the direct pathway. 
And it's not the full place preference, but they still get a place preference. It's at least showing that just the opiate receptors on the direct pathway, and presumably their actions through the direct pathway, are then sufficient for place preference. I have one more uh, on this direct pathway. There's also one more kind of line of evidence on this. There's been work now using, um, not specifically, but looking at glutamatergic input to the striatum. So this is input that's going to hit direct, indirect pathway, and interneurons, presumably. Um, so in this study, this was uh, from Antovanchi's lab, John Britt, looked at three main projections to the accumbens. So here we're seeing, here we're seeing the sort of macro zoomed out view the ventral hippocampus, the amygdala, and prefrontal cortex. And here we're looking at the same view of the accumbens in each of them, showing that all three of these structures send fiber projections into the accumbens. So sort of this is quantifying the relative projections, um, core shell, core, and, uh, and then medial lateral shell. But when they would do uh, either place preference or lever pressing, what we're seeing here is place preference, or this is real-time place preference. And you see that all three of these if they do three sessions and even a probe, so a condition place preference, doesn't matter where you're getting your input from the accumbens. These are stimulating in the accumbens from you can have the virus injected in ventral hippocampus, amygdala, or PFC. All of these are sufficient for this real time and condition place preference. All of them are also sufficient for nose pokes. They'll do a more traditional operant. So, one interpretation is that it's going to probably go, this reinforcement is probably going through the direct pathway. Maybe it just doesn't matter what else you're stimulating as long as you stimulate the direct pathway. Um, it's also kind of interesting to think that these projections may be specific, um, not 100% specific, but maybe specific for direct pathway. So this was a study, um, Nick Wall um, with Ed Calloway and Anatole Kreitzer, they did a, a mapping study where they the kind of interesting two virus strategy of looking at specific cell type specific projections to cells. So we first have, this is using a rabies or a pseudo-rabies virus. Rabies is a retrograde tracer. It requires a helper, it requires a TBA molecule to infect cells. So they have, first in flex means um, like pre-dependent in the virus. So first they express this help, helper molecule. So only cells that have the TBA can now be infected with this pseudo-rabies virus. So they did this in D1 pre and D2 pre animals hitting the direct and indirect pathway. And then they put the second virus comes in three weeks later, and it's only going to infect the cells that got, you know, either the D1 if this was a D1 free mouse. We have getting cell type specific projections to a structure. Um, this paper is a ton of information, um, very interesting. So I'm just going to. Uh, what we're looking at here is the number of uh, of positive cells in a whole survey all the way through the brain. Um, direct or indirect pathway. What you can notice is that most brain regions project to both. There may be some quantitative difference, but most of these bars have projections to both. Two of them that I'm going to point out, um, this one, they're calling it cingulate, um, which is sort of a prelimbic, infralimbic. Cingulate is often a, a primate term. But in the mouse, what you would call prelimbic, infralimbic. It's hitting, and that's where this um, brick paper was injecting to hit the accumbent. It's hitting mainly direct pathway neurons. Also amygdala. Um, amygdala synapses on direct pathway. So I think it's possible you go back. <coughs> so I think it's possible that these projections are hitting more things, but it's also possible that they're very selective for direct pathway stimulation in that. You know, that explains why they have very similar behavioral responses to stimulating terminals as you would just from stimulating these cells themselves. Last piece of evidence in support of that, this was an earlier paper from Garrett Stuber, um, who is in Fonchi's lab. And here we're looking at a mouse, again, um, basal lateral amygdala, but putting fiber into the striatum or into the accumbent, stimulating amygdala projections to the, to the accumbent. This is an example of a mouse that's active nose folks. And at some point, about 30 minutes into the session, this example mouse figured it out that if he pokes, he's getting the accumbent stimulation and starts taking off. This is the quantification <coughs> that you know, mice that have chandradops in will self-stimulate this amygdala to a Cummins projection, same as in the Brick paper. But what they did in this study that's kind of interesting, they also 
did this with some pharmacology. So they did the same behavior, injecting raclopride, which is a D2 antagonist, and SCH23390, which is a D1 antagonist. They mentioned these direct pathway neurons have the dopamine D1 receptor on them, which is an excitatory receptor. If you antagonize this receptor, the mice actually won't learn to nose poke. But presumably, they're keeping these cells from firing, and those cells firing is the basis of this reinforcement. So I'll kind of talk you through several lines of evidence on this one projection. Um, I'm going to summarize it here that all getting at that this, this projection is sufficient for reinforcement. In fact, maybe a conversion point of many forms of reinforcement. Um, so you can simulate these cells alone It's reinforcing. It can increase the reinforcing value of cocaine, although I mentioned that in that study, it may be that it's, it's the reinforcement. That may have been the reinforcement of that study. Um, if you inhibit it, this has been done with threads, and I showed you the optogenetic data. Um, you can impair locomotor sensitization, which is also presumably occurring through this pathway. You can, the opiate preference is solely sufficient from opiate receptors just on this pathway and nowhere else in the body. And then lastly, that you can do glutamatergic input to the whole, um, in these cases, this was also the accumbens, the ventral part of the striatum, but you can do the extra glutamate in there. And it's reinforcing probably because the places that people have found have been using selectively synapse onto direct pathway neurons. Um, are there any questions? I'm going to move on to the, these other two. Thing. So um, bring this back into addiction, I'm going to say one more thing about direct pathway. Um, to think about how drugs of abuse end up interfacing with this. Um, it's a pretty straightforward story with this dopamine D1 receptor being excitatory. So all drugs of abuse um, increase midbrain dopamine neurons. That's sort of this common pathway. But they'll increase mid the firing, or they'll increase the tone of the dopamine tone in the brain. So it could be through the midbrain dopamine neurons increasing the firing could be at the level of the striatum, um, increasing dopamine release or blocking its reuptake. So we've seen all of these studies that if these cells fire, it's sufficient for reinforcement. It's a fairly easy um, link that to say maybe you know drugs increase dopamine. These cells have an excitatory dopamine receptor, the D1 receptor, therefore drugs make dopamine, make the cells fire, and reinforce whatever behavior um, brought that brought the drugs there in the first place. So the, the question is uh, that many drugs don't increase motor behavior. So how are they doing reinforcement if they're not increasing? Well, if they're actually that pathway, that normally increases motor behavior, why is not? Yeah, so mainly because they're, they're activating other pathways as well. So I would think that if you stimulate, well, so I'm going to tell you one thing, and then I'm going to um, give you a, another idea. But um, I would think if you stimulate just the part of that of the drug that is is increasing midbrain dopamine or increasing dopamine tone, you in fact would get an increase in movement. Um, if you have a drug acts on all over the body, like opiate receptors, spinal cord, everywhere, so you have other systems that maybe something like opiates don't increase motor behavior. Um, another idea is that it may be that there's subsurface through here that are specifically involved in movement and other subsurfaces that are involved more in reinforcement or even specific types of reinforcement. So one sort of caveat to optogenetics, and maybe we can talk about this at the end, is that you're, you know, we're turning on all direct pathway neurons. That doesn't really happen. And if you put recording electrodes in, and the animal does a task or something, you see a population that responds when you notice folks, but you never see every cell in the, or every direct pathway neuron firing. So it, I think this is a possible that you know, reinforcing effects of, are running through different channels than movement effects. Basically, when, when you're talking about striatum, you're talking about the whole striatum, ventral and dorsal striatum. Uh, um, in terms of <coughs> locomotion, <coughs> excuse me, there, are, there are some drugs that, of course, don't produce hyperlocomotion, even produce hyperlocomotion and produce rewarding effect. But remember that all drugs of abuse are able to enhance dopaminergic activity in the ventral, in the ventral striatum. So that can be completely independent from the motor response. These are, I, I agree that these are 
two completely independent uh, responses. And, and, and for a long time, it well known that the reward is independent on, 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 on locomotion. There was a old theory just relating reward and locomotion, but today everybody knows that the locomotion and the hyper locomotion and the reward is something that is completely independent. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Also, I'm, I'm kind of lumping striatum here, and um, even hopefully, I think I had it right in the titles at least of these things. I don't know if they go back, but um, some of these studies are ventral striatum, some of them are dorsal striatum. Yeah. So, the last thing I'm going to um, go through a, there's been several studies of stimulating dopamine neurons <laughs> um, and looking at the reinforcing, reinforcing properties of dopamine neurons, which um, it's not, it's not explicit that it's coming through dopamine to the direct pathway neurons, but I think that's sort of the implication that we know that stimulating these cells is reinforcing, we know dopamine goes to the striatum, and in fact stimulating the other population is punishing, I'll show you in a little bit. So presumably it, um, to stimulate dopamine neurons, the reinforcing effects are coming through the direct pathway. Um, so there's at least six, and I'm not going to go through them. Um, I'm just going to show the first one because it was, because it was the first one. Um, showing that stimulating dopamine neurons themselves are uh, sufficient for positive reinforcement. So here they did stimulating cell bodies in the VTA. At the time, they were actually using a guide cannula. Um, they did the virus injection through there, and then they also put the fiber optic running through the cannula. Um, a t I guess a technical point. That this was what was happening in the um, early in optogenetics, and it has an advantage where you get the virus right in the same place as the fiber optic. Um, people generally stop doing it, and mainly it's just technical that when you try to put the, the fiber is a thin piece of glass, and you try to put it through the cannula, it's not uncommon that it snaps, and then you have, you know, your whole experiment is over. You have the thing clogged up. So um, mainly people now will use a ferrule and sort of a system that's, the whole thing is implanted. And it's my, my belief that it's simply because the fibers were snapping in the cannulas, because Beyond that, there's so many advantages that if you have actually have a cannula, you know your virus is right at the bottom of it. You can infuse drugs before your experiment and then do optogenetics locally, all of this. There's a lot of advantages. It was just a terrible time of putting fibers in and they would snap. And so that was my experience with it. We would probably lose about half the mice just by trying to plug them in. Um, so with this, with, in this experiment, we're looking at uh, um, they were either getting sort of a real-time place preference. They were either getting phasic, which was 20 hertz dim, or they're calling tonic, which is 1 hertz dim. And before the test, there's no, you know, no preference. After the test, turns out they like more stim of the dopamine neurons. We're being quantified here. So if you look at the um, time in the chamber, they spend more time on the, on the side that they were getting the phasic stim on. And then people have done this. I'm going to show you one other study that's um, young go, but people have Many people have done forms of reinforcement with stimulating dopamine neurons or their projection terminals. Um, and not a huge surprise that stimulating these neurons is very reinforcing. So uh, just to show you that this one, this was an operant reinforcement, um, lever press <coughs> stimulation. And the reason I'm showing this, it's kind of interesting getting at also the ventral and dorsal streams of dopamine. So let's talk you through this. Here we're looking at lever pressing. And this is in a 30 minute session. These are extremely high numbers. We're getting up, you know, 2,000 lever presses in a 30-minute session, which is, I don't know, can't do the math on, in my head, but it's basically all he's doing is, is triggering the lever. Uh, and then they ran sessions across time. And we're looking at each line here is an individual mouse. So they went a few baseline sessions, three of those. They acquired the lever pressing did extinction, which is where you see it come down, and then they reacquired. And that's the shape of this curve that we're seeing. Um, the things, two things to appreciate here. One is the, the strength of this behavior, that they're, you know, some of these mics are really, all they're doing is lever pressing. Um, and the other is that they were actually doing this in the dorsal and ventral um, in streams of dopamine, so into the substantia nigra, compacta, and also in DTA. So we're seeing in red are nigra um, injections, and in blue, kind of behind here, it's a little harder to see, but there's the blue lines behind, um, those are VTA. And then the green are control mice that don't express. Um, and one of the interesting things, you might generally think that VTA is 
responsible more for the reinforcement and the ventral BTA to accumbens should be the stronger lever pressing. But they basically got, it didn't matter where they were in the midbrain. Um, the relevant detail that distinguishes who's a high responder or a low responder was the volume of expression. So whether it's NIGRA or VTA was irrelevant to how strongly they respond. Um, they also, this is something nice they did in the study, they also did it with um, inhibition using haloridopsin. So here we're, uh, now we're looking at sessions one through eight, and they have either NIGRA or VTA inhibition and four sessions where the right side is stimulated, four sessions where the left side is stimulated, you see that the mice learn, you know, stay away from the stimulation, so this would be inhibiting dopamine neurons, is, um, it's punishing. They learn to stay away from that. When they switch the side that they're getting stimulated on, they learn to switch as well and stay away from that. Um, the last point of this, um, as far as I know, nobody's shown that the, you know you stimulate the dopamine neurons, this is going through the direct pathway. No one sort of explicitly made that link. Um, probably, however, people have made just about every other link that you stimulate dopamine neurons, it's reinforcing. You stimulate direct pathway neurons, that's reinforcing. You stimulate dopamine neurons, they project to the striatum, and in fact, they induce FOS there. I think the one like minor point that's missing, so this is a study where they did phasic BPA stimulation and then looked at FOS in the accumbens. And when you stimulate, so you're driving some form of activity there. I think the one minor detail that has, unless I'm wrong, um, that I haven't found is that if these cells are actually direct pathway neurons, um, which could have been you know, an experiment just like this, but doing it in a mouse that expresses some marker in the direct pathway. Um, a minor technical point is that there's no, there's no good stains for the direct pathway, so you end up needing to use some form of a mouse that expresses a fluorescent marker. Um, there is the D1 receptor, but there, it's not expressed at high levels enough that an antibody stain. There's no good antibodies on the D1 receptor. Um, so this is sort of the summary of all those dopamine ones, and rather than go through them all, and I didn't go through the data that stimulating dopamine neurons is very reinforcing. Um, so we've got, um, now I'm going to move on past the direct pathway, but an idea of where this compulsive part of drugs of abuse is and the relationship between compulsion and unconscious behavior or is, is reinforcement is they increase dopamine, that increases activity in the striatum, presumably it, it's those direct pathway neurons and then they themselves are sufficient for reinforcement. When I had the, um, before you move on, when I had the So the question is the, whether the phasic activation is, is leading to the direct pathway. And the short answer I would say yes. That, so it needs to be a, a burst of sort of phasic activation. So there's a tonic tone of dopamine um, that presumably activates more the indirect pathway, more the D2 receptor. That receptor is a lot more sensitive than the D1 receptor. So if there's sort of low levels tonic dopamine, it can activate the D2 receptor. Those receptors are also extrasynaptic, so it kind of makes sense that they would just be sensing the tonic levels of dopamine in the striatum. Um, the D1 receptor is less sensitive and often in synapses, so it probably requires you know bursts of activity to get that receptor enough to, to drive these cells to fire. So now I'm going to skip over, I mean, we'll do the prefrontal cortex um, at the end, but I just want to skip to this because we're already in the striatum. We're now going to talk about this indirect pathway, and I'm going to present um, some evidence that the indirect pathway is at least uh, um, partially responsible for this uh, emergence of a negative emotional state in addiction. So the right away we get into this issue I alluded to before of like, you know, how do you study an emotional state in a mouse? And I think there's at least two logical ways through this um, that don't require um, us to really know what a mouse feels like. And I think, I don't know, for me that's the bottom line. We don't know. Only a mouse knows what it feels like to be a mouse, I'm sure. Thinking about anxiety states and what it feels like to be depressed or anxious as a human, 
and whether the mouse is feeling that is kind of apples and oranges. Um, but we can get around it in at least two ways that I'll bring up. I brought up one already, which is um, reinforcement and punishment. So this argument is great. It has its own internal logic, which is that you're going to be agnostic to what the mouse is feeling. But we can study whether the behavior goes up or down. If it goes up, we're going to call it reinforcement. If it goes down, we're going to call it punishment. With the knowledge that in humans, things that feel good are generally reinforcing. Things that feel bad are generally punishing. So there is a relationship to humans there. but. It doesn't require that you're making that same relationship um, in a mouse or understanding its emotional states. So I think this is a um, gets you a lot of the way there. There's another way that I'll, I'll uh, bring up. Um, but, so what we wanted to study with respect to the indirect pathway is the punishment side of this um, curve. And basically, if we're stimulating, it's going to be positive punishment. Removing a, a I've done a little bit with, and it's turned out to be a lot more difficult. And maybe we can talk about that. But um, so in this same study, we also did this with indirect pathway um, channel reduction in mice. What we see is the opposite effect that they'll actually learn to stay away from this trigger. So they go over there, they get a one second burst to the indirect pathway, and over 30 minutes, they learn to stay away from it. They uh, kind of remember, but actually they're sort of relearning by day three. Um, and there's, this was true with a lot of mice. They just don't seem to remember it as well as with the direct pathway. Um, it's even clearer here. So this is that um, place preference, real time, and then the condition. Um, uh, this is that conditioning test. I'm calling it extinction because the at this point, the laser has been turned off. So two days of training, they learn in 30 minutes. They learn to stay away from the side that they were getting the stimulation. Again, this was the two seconds on, eight seconds off. And we came to this because when we were doing the study at first, we just left it on permanently, and the mice went there and froze. Um, so the eight seconds was enough that they could then choose to come back if they don't. If they stayed there, they'd get two seconds every ten seconds. Uh, they learned to stay away. They for day two they have to relearn it, and then when you turn it off and bring them back for a condition test, there's no conditioning. So this is kind of a an interesting difference. There's a literature on reinforcement and punishment, and reinforcement tends to last longer than punishment, um, sort of in animal training, children training, all of that. Um, I, it could be that, that there actually is a physiological basis here. It could also be we're jumping into the middle of a circuit with the optogenetics. So maybe it's just you know, a feature of how we're delivering this, that normal punishment through this pathway when it gets it through synaptic input may be fine for learning. Um, I don't think we know that yet. Um, but what we can say is it's kind of interesting that they, they really forget. And when you watch them do these tasks, it's, it's obvious they forgot. Because <laughs> it's not like um, if you do something with a shock, if you use a shock as punishment, he may do it once or twice in the beginning, and then he stays away. And just, you know, he's learned, and he stays away. These mice would go over there. They'd get the simulation, they'd run out. So they go over there, you know, get their simulation, run back to this side. And then about 30 seconds later, they're exploring again, and they're walking back in. And it, it really looks like the first time they've gotten it. It's almost funny to watch them because they're like, don't you know, you don't like this. You just, you know, we've been doing this for 30, 30 minutes. And even by the end, they're still exploring over there. Uh, there's only two chambers in this place preference, right? So you have to start, we call it extinction, but it's actually like a post test by mm -hmm. placing the mouse in either the conditioned or unconditioned chamber. So you will have bias at the beginning. So what, how? Yeah, so what, the what, what did you put the yeah, the question was, where did we start this? So um, often you would do this with three chambers. You can have a center one to minimize the bias that he starts in the center. And you don't start out with data already <coughs> being, you know, if you put him down and he sits there for two minutes, that's two minutes of preference. But really, it's not. Um, so the way that we got around this, um, or the way that we decided to address this, was to start it after he had made one crossing. So we put him down, and the program was waiting for him to make one crossing. So he at least had been in each one before this, <coughs> before the, it started into counting. It's something that <laughs> gets you somewhere with that. Uh, if you have the, I think the three chambered box is a, a nicer way to do this, to remove the bias. So, so I mentioned this paper before, this uh, Mary K. Lobo. They also um, did the same thing with the indirect pathway. Not, not exactly the same. And so we see the drug dose here. They actually, in this one, they gave a dose that 
her normal mice was sufficient to, to create the place preference. And when they do that place preference, a pair to cocaine with stimulation of the indirect pathway, it's reduced. So the interpretation here is that stimulating the indirect pathway, it's punishing on its own. It's also dropping the, the condition reinforcing value of cocaine in a condition place preference paradigm. Um, this is a more recent paper from uh, Veronica Alvarez's lab. What we're looking at here is actually the intake of cocaine. So if you pair the, um, the reinforcement with, if you do a self stimulation, sorry, self administration of cocaine, but do blocks where they're also getting stimulation of the indirect pathway. Um, so what we're seeing here is off, on, off, on, and we're seeing number in red, we're getting cocaine infusions. In black, we're getting active, and you can't really see, but there's an inactive ticks down here as well. So every, you know, he's, he's pressing, he's getting cocaine. Then they do a block where they're getting intermittent um, indirect pathway stimulation. And it's interesting that, noticeably, even, even when the stimulation is not <coughs> in this block, it's causing a um, cessation of his cocaine <coughs> intake. And then they repeated it, so that they do a block where it's off, and then a block where it's on. Um, one thing that happens when you stimulate the indirect pathway, um, uh, I don't have a video of this in here, but I, I could find a video, but I'll just say, um, so the mice will actually freeze. So I think it, one interpretation thing to keep in mind with all of these, um, especially the indirect pathway, is that there are motor effects and they can be very strong. So a study like this, you know, if you stimulate them strongly enough, it wouldn't be surprising that you've frozen the mouse who's no longer self-administering. Um, but what they've done here is, you know, they've given him chances and they're quite long. I think this is like five minutes on, 10 minutes off. So he has, and it's very, it's very reversible. The freezing is, it, it, um, Within seconds, he's moving around again. So really, there's something about stimulating these cells that's keeping him from self-administering. Um, what we're seeing here, are, these are individual mice that are on three different, you know, it's eight mice, three different lever pressing paradigms. It's kind of just raw data that they put in just to show each mouse when they stimulate was uh, was administering less cocaine than the average there. Um, this was the. Uh, I mentioned this paper um, that inhibiting, that they used an inhibitory drug to either inhibit direct or indirect pathway neurons. And the direct pathway, when they, um, I showed you the optogenetic data, the same thing that it inhibited the um, locomotor sensitization of cocaine. When they inhibit the indirect pathway, it actually increases locomotor sensitization. So this is a normal mouse, and you see um, injections and the number of crossovers is what they're counting um, using a beam break chamber. So with a normal mouse or a mouse just expressing a fluorophore, you see the sensitization across days. When they inhibit the indirect pathway, it's much stronger. Um, so to summarize all these indirect pathway, um, at least for some of them, it's punishing on its own. Um, it reduces the preference and the self-administration of cocaine. And it has this effect that it reduces amphetamine sensitization, similar to how the um, stimulating direct pathway actually facilitates that sensitization. Um, when they also when they inhibit it, that's the one study I showed with the dread. You can actually increase the sensitization. So I mentioned the the uh, the symptom we're looking at here is negative emotional states, and this is all getting through that using punishment as a proxy for a negative emotional state. Um, but how else can we make inferences? Uh, with the, <coughs> the disruption of uh, cocaine effect and cocaine rewarding effects. If you compare with a drug that also impairs locomotion, like uh, this uh, manipulation, uh, what, what's, the, what's the difference? Yeah. So the, the question here was on this study, you know, this manipulation is, at least while the light's on, impairing locomotion, and maybe there's something lasting that's taking them through here. So what if you had a drug that also um, and I actually am, I'm not sure, I imagine with the drug it will do the same thing, so the drug never turns off. So if you have a... So, so how, how do you dissociate this locomotor effect from the pure rewarding effect? I, uh, I think it would be very difficult. I don't know if you have an answer to this, but the question, how would you dissociate? Well, you have locomotor effects of a lot of these drugs. If you've made a mouse, frozen in the corner, you're no longer studying self-administration. But it's, or it's not fair to say he doesn't want to self-administer anymore. Um, do you have an answer on how you dissociate them? <laughs> 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 
question about so uh, you show that if you stimulate indirect pathway function, mm -hmm. what about inhibiting indirect pathway as a warning? So we tr I've tried to do this in a few ways. Yes, yeah, so the question is we stimulate it and it's punishing. If you inhibit it, would it be rewarding? Um, it should be, <laughs> but I've tried to do this and it had not been very successful with that. So the thing I've tried is putting halo reduction in an indirect pathway um, and try to get them to lever press for it. I've also tried putting shadow reduction in and get them to lever, get them to lever press, sorry, um, nose poke, um, get them to nose poke to turn it off. So that would be sort of like, you know, turn it on so they don't like that and then will they learn the nose poke to turn it off? And I can't, wasn't able to do either of those. Um, so I think, you know, just because you try something that doesn't work doesn't mean it can't be done with a different simulation paradigm or maybe more expression or stronger laser or something. Um, what I thought about with inhibiting it, the reason that um, I didn't think that was, or one reason why that may not have worked, is these cells are pretty low firing, so they're not very active, and it's possible that just inhibiting a low firing structure is, you're not getting much bang for your buck when you're not really doing much of a manipulation at all, because they're already not firing. So that's possible that that's the problem, but. But if you argue that this false might encode the gap emotional state, would it be actually, so, because the question is what do they actually, what's the function, like what would, would mm -hmm. do they signal? Mm -hmm. And if they have like a low activity, they just like a background really. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess, I don't know. The other, um, the other thing that came up that maybe, if you remember that they don't remember the stimulation part of it, the mice, so it's possible that to try to get them to learn, like I was trying to get them to learn to turn it off, or learn to either learn to turn it off with halo rhodopsin or learn to turn it off by stopping the channel rhodopsin. And it's possible that, you know, in those moments while you're inhibiting it, that may be relieving an emotional state that as soon as you turn the laser off, there's nothing conditioning there. So if your output is an animal needing to you know, to learn a behavior, we may we may not just not be able to learn it through the stimulation. Does that make sense? So it seems like this might be where you're going next. But so if you if you stimulate the indirect pathway, um, do you see changes in anxiety like or depressive like? That's exactly where we're going. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So the the other way um, the other way through this, you know, not reinforcement and punishment, which has one problem where you are relying on learning. And we've already seen the indirect pathway, they weren't so good at learning that. So for you know, who knows what reason, you know, I've come up with a lot of reasons, but the conditioning for the indirect pathway didn't stick. So maybe there's other ways. And um, one way is to, this is a zero maze, an elevated zero maze. Um, it's for looking at anxiety-like behavior. And I think this is another logical way through this problem. Um, it's not still not saying that the mouse is feeling an anxiety state that's similar to ours. It's saying, is, is this? Um, is this mouse having it? Or does his behavior have any predictive validity for testing drugs that um, relieve anxiety states in humans? So you're still, you know, logically, we don't, mouse still doesn't need to have a feeling that's like ours, but his behavior will be affected by a drug in a way that is predictive for a drug that would um, alleviate anxiety in humans. Um, so the way this task works is, and it's very similar, um, the more commonly used is a plus where two open arms, two, two closed arms, and a plus configuration. Um, we did this with a zero. Uh, there's one benefit to each. I think either I think they're basically interchangeable, but each has its own little subtlety. Um, the plus has a center region that, you know, he's, he's in the open or the closed arm, except he also can hang out in the center, and that's a little ambiguous which region he's in at that point. Um, not a huge deal, but that's one thing. Um, so we like the zero because he's either got to be in an open or a closed. I will say the positive of the um, of the plus is that if there's, let's say he gets very hyperactive, he can you know he could spend all day being hyperactive between the two closed arms. In the plus, he's going to have a harder time doing that here. So I think there's sort of some subtle um, benefits to either test. Um, but this is the one that we used, and uh, from, from, from the point of view, the, the main difference is just the the influence of uh, locomotion. If you have a possible bias in locomotion, a bias in locomotion will be much higher in a, let's say, automatic response like this one than the other. The other is you can change your decision. 
Mm -hmm. Though, of course, the commercial can be a bias in both tests, but uh, the, the bias will be higher in, in a, in a elevated zero maze than mm -hmm. in elevated class maze. So I'm going to show you something, and then I have a, I'll find the slide um, so we can look at locomotion specifically. Um, but the way this works, you put the mouse on here, and I'll show you a video of it. You simulate one pathway. Um, we've been talking about locomotion a lot. So we actually started looking at the very low end of simulation for these studies. So uh, because it doesn't help, again, to have a mouse frozen on the maze. Um, so we're at 0.1 milliwatts, which for, I mentioned before, a lot of these behaviors, like the punishment stuff I was doing, that was at one milliwatt. The literature, people go up to 20 milliwatts in the striatum. Um, we're now at 0.1, so 100 microwatts, very small levels of simulation. We've even gone to 50 microwatts, and you can still get some of these. It's, I mean, it's, for some contrast, I think this is about three milliwatts for laser pointers, so about a you know, 100 fold lower than that um, level of like it's, it doesn't look like a lot of sin. You're looking at uh, just a. Then you're going to get a subslice of neurons, right? Or the closest ones to the fiber. So, could any of this have anything to do with the subcellular distribution? I mean, the cellular distribution of spiny neurons, the ones most dorsal, the closest to the fiber, versus the more ventral, farther away from the fiber. Yeah, so the point is that if you really drop the power, it's it penetrates less. You know, higher power will penetrate more tissue. So really, we're getting, we're probably activating just the ones closest to the fiber, so a smaller population. Um, yeah, I think you probably want to test that explicitly. If, so far, we don't see differences between mice. Like, we haven't found a part of the, this is all in dorsal medial striatum, but we haven't found a certain part that does this. It doesn't, you know, like all the mice do it, so it's, and our fiber placements, we're targeting them all to dorsal medial, but there will be some variance there. I think you could probably be explicit and you know move some to dorsal lateral, some to accumbens, and see if if that matter. If, you know, if it didn't matter there, then I would say there's probably not like some very local regional thing. Um, the way that we ran this, and this also gets into some of the experimental designs with optogenetics. Um, this looks a little confusing. This was the least confusing way I could figure out to do this. Um, we ran um, so with this indirect pathway simulation. And I think with other simulation, there can be some carryover <coughs> sorts of things. So if you look at like their motor behavior, you freeze them. If you look at a long period, even when it's off, you can have some carryover. So to get around this, we ran trials that where they were on trials and trials where it's off. All the trials were going one minute on, one minute off. So it's a 10 minute task on the zero maze, five minutes of stim, five minutes of non interspersed. Um, but then on another day, we would do in off versus off. And then our comparisons are between sort of the fake, you know, the, the same time periods interleave when you, on a simulation day versus a non simulation day. Oh, Matt, you're probably wondering how we came to this confusing thing. And of course, it started, we were doing off versus on. And we were seeing that the off periods were very similar to the on periods. Once the stimulation started, his anxiety behavior carried through. Um, I'm going to show you a cool video of this because then my postdoc made this video. So this is the this is the behavior. This is the zero maze itself. And we're seeing the mouse getting tracked. So you'll see he spends most of his time in the closed arms. Um, typically they'll spend about 80-90% of their time in the closed arms, regardless. And now the LED is on. This is an LED for simulation. So if we turn this, um, we're going to present this data in a couple of ways. One way is to present it as a heat map. If we make a heat map of where he spends his time, um, so this will be this mouse. Um, these are on that LED on day. This is the LED off day. And you can probably appreciate that they're spending a little more time, or this mouse, this is an indirect pathway stimulation mouse. Not that. This is now an average of. Um, groups of mice, either indirect pathway stimulation or um, mice, wild type mice. We're calling them, they, they actually are wild type. And, yeah, these are wild type mice that have fiber implants, they have a virus, the virus um, doesn't express anything because they're, they don't have any great 
Um, but they still get all the simulation and everything and the tether done now. Um, and we can see from these is that normal mice spend most of their time in the closed arms regardless. But if we look between off and on, the, when the simulation's on, these mice really don't like to leave the closed arms. Um, this is being quantified here. Um, and this is work that Kim LeBlanc said, or Kim LeBlanc um, is working on now in my lab. But so wild pet mice, they don't care off or on their you know, the laser itself, or the light itself is not changing their Jerome's behavior. But simulating the indirect pathway, um, sorry, I, mean, I have a couple different nomenclatures here, but this is an A2A pre-mouse is how we're targeting the indirect pathway. So these are simulating them, reduces the time in the open arms. Um, we brought up that locomotor, I can show you a slide at the end if we have a minute, but brought up the, the locomotor compound that these mice are in fact slower while they're getting stimulated, even at the low power, we're still there. Um, we tried to find powers that didn't change their loc locomotor speed, and we really couldn't. It's like almost as soon as 50 microwatts, we're still getting slight decreases in movement. So from the video, though, we have that video track, and we can pull out um, movement and rest periods, basically equalize movement that way. So say, let's only look at movement when he is moving. Where does he want to spend his time moving? Um, and that's and this effect still holds up if you equalize the amount that they move. So, so those are the two ways of, of, that we've been getting this negative emotional state um, and linking it through the indirect pathway. I'm now going to spend, ah, sorry, I'm going to talk a bit about um, an addiction literature. What are you doing on, yeah, I'll get to talk a bit on an addiction literature that, you know, is this actually relevant? Is there any indication that the indirect pathway does play a role in the negative emotional states of addicts? Um, and the idea here is that what we saw through, if I kind of take you through an animation of what we saw in these punishment studies, is he goes over there, we stimulate, it stimulates the indirect pathway, it reduces reinforcement, presumably is reducing reward, putting him in this negative state. He runs away to, to relieve that inhibition, and now everything's back to normal. What if this, these neurons were just chronically firing a little bit too much? Chronically, you know, whatever is going on, nothing related to behavior, they're just always on. Um, would that be sufficient to create this persistent negative emotional state? And I believe that's actually what's happening in addiction. Probably one of the more replicated human findings in addiction um, is something that Nora Volkoff, who's going to speak later, has had a lot, a large, um, kind of built up a large literature and many other people um, looking at the D2 receptor in the striatum. In, um, in this slide, this was the first report of it in cocaine abusers, but. Um, it's been done with heroin, with alcohol, with nicotine, with obesity. So actually, the next slide I'll show you is an obesity slide. Um, so basically, so um, let's just say addicts of many different um, types of, of addictions are associated with lower D2 receptors in the striatum. D2 receptor is on these indirect pathway neurons. It's an inhibitory receptor. So when you have lower D2 receptors, it's not so far of a jump to say you know these cells are probably more active. No one's actually shown that, but that's the, that's the leap I'm kind of taking you experimentally. Um, that's sort of the hypothesis. So this is just getting at that again. D2 receptor has several actions, but it's an inhibitory receptor. Um, another example of, of this, if you put in a D2 antagonist, the Tiklopride, this was West and Grace, with an intracellular anesthetized recording, the striatal cells are not very active, especially under anesthesia. But if you put a D2 antagonist, they start to fire even under anesthesia. So again, it's not that these, you know, this is not, having a D2 antagonist and having low D2 levels of D2 receptors are different, but they're kind of in the same direction. It's possible that people with low activity, low D2 receptors have too much activity through the indirect pathway. And we've seen that create, it's sufficient for punishment, it creates this anxiety-like state. Um, so that's sort of. Last point on that indirect pathway. So last time, a few papers I'm going to show you get at um, prefrontal cortex and its role in loss of um, control limiting intake. And this is this literature is a little more, um, a little harder to pull together. I think the fact is that there's a lot of literature that the cortical projections are related to the controlling intake. The optogenetic work, though, is um, it's more. I'm just going to present what it is. The studies have been done on it, but it's a little harder to pull together in one. Um, so the work that's been done on just sort of establishing this, and I think the, base, the basis has been established, it's more whether we've, optogenetics has added it, 
um, clear demonstrations of it yet. Um, but there's a lot of cognitive deficits that are associated with addiction that can be linked to um, cortical functioning. There's also um, metabolism work. So again, um, many people, um, including Nora Wolf, have done this, you know, looked at prefrontal metabolism in, in addiction and found that these areas are hypoactive. And interestingly, they're hypoactive in a way that correlates with the D2 availability. So now, this is actually, these are obese patients. Um, but we're looking at our group of patients, and we're looking at on the um, on the y-axis D2 receptor availability. So finding, I believe this is a uh, radio labeled raclocride, and then they, so they scanned all these patients in PET, and then they scanned them again um, in a, um, a metabolic scan for fluorodeoxyglucose. We're seeing the level of, of metabolism in all of these frontal regions has pretty strong correlation with the levels of D2 receptor availability. So the, there's uh, three papers I'm going to present optogenetic work on um, stimulating or inhibiting prefrontal. The first, this is from uh, Billy Chen and Banshee's group. I, I like this paper, and the results are extremely clear and also um, in line with this. And then the next two get make it show that it's a little more um, maybe a little more complicated, or, or it can be. In this paper, they did uh, long access, so four to five weeks, um, and then two to three weeks, four to five weeks of this, of learning the self-administering, two to three weeks of long access. Um, they then do, a, um, they then do, at the end, a contingent foot shock thing. And that was, what that was is that 30% of the trials where they're getting the cocaine are also paired with a foot shock. And this um, separated the rats into two groups. We see that they're, you know, the baseline and then the shock. This is these two. Some some of the rats just quit. Once you start shocking them on a, one out of three trials, they just stop taking cocaine. But some of them don't really care. They still, you know, it goes down a little bit, but they don't. They'll still take even with cocaine. So they separate that into the sensitive and the resistant ones, which you're seeing. You know, sensitive is they stop once you get shots. When they looked, they did uh, patched onto these cells in the prefrontal cortex. They found that their excitability of all of the cells was way lower. So there may be something cellular that the cocaine has done to these rats. That all of them are much lower than naive animals. Um, looking at um, input output, so input into the cell and firing out. But the the resistant mice, the ones that don't care about the shocks, are really, you know, they put a bunch of current in and there's just no firing. They really are not. These cells, um, at least in these in vitro conditions, are not firing. Very consistent with the hypometabolism in humans. They now took these sensitive rats. Um, I'm sorry, they took the resistant ones. These are these compulsive ones, and they tried. They gave them uh, two times of channeldopsin stim to the prefrontal cortex. This is basically to bring back the activity um, that may be hypoactive, and they have data from before they did the shocks and data from after they did the shocks. See if the channel redoxin stim does anything. We're seeing on the top is the data from before, and we're looking at things like the cocaine and the latency, all stuff. Basically, the point here is that nothing changed just from stimulating these. So before they've had the shocks, they, they like taking cocaine, and they like taking it the same amount if you stimulate the prefrontal cortex. After they've had the shocks, now these are mice that are are uh, compulsive, they're resistant, they'll just continue to take it through the shock. So if you kind of compare black to green, we're looking at no stimulation, just how much of an effect did the shock have. And you'll see the shock really doesn't affect these rats very much. But if they stimulate a mouse that's, or a rat that's been shocked, now he's you know, taking less cocaine, having longer latencies, he's basically acting more like a sensitive rat. So the shock's having an effect if you keep the, the cortex on. They did the same thing the other way in those sensitive rats. These are ones that, if you could compare between black and green, these are very sensitive. They're, you know, they stopped taking once they got the shots. But if you inhibit the cortex, they now become resistant. They will, you know, even though they've been shocked and they don't want it, while the inhibition's on, they start taking the cocaine. So that's all very clear and in line with that idea that the cortex is um, serving this inhibitory control role. There's two papers that kind of get a little bit of the other, they're opposite in some ways. Um, so in these studies were um, from um, Colitis Labs, Stephonic. Um, I'm gonna show, show data from one that these rats self-administer, 
They then extinguish and they do Q and D to reinstatement. So it's a different behavior. It's not this compulsive um, seeking in the presence of shocks, all that. Um, but what they found is inhibiting the, the prefrontal cortex, so making more, you might expect that should enhance the, you know, their willingness to take drugs and everything. It does the opposite, so it actually reduces. So here we're seeing um, after extinction, this is the Q-induced reinstatement in sham surgery animals, and this is the Q-induced reinstatement while they're inhibiting. So I think the secret that kind of unifies these two is the behavior matters, that obviously things are more complicated than you turn on a whole structure, you turn off a whole structure. And probably as you get into the behavior and the differences between a Q-induced reinstatement um, versus compulsive seeking, the cortex may have a different role. Excuse me, it was showing this, uh, the dose dependency, am I right? In the previous slide, if you go back, uh, those rats which they were resistant to the shock, mm -hmm. they were using more self-administration, and they got higher dose, and then they got resistance, or not? Um, I don't believe in this study that that, no, that, it's, uh, and also in other ones, it's not necessarily how much cocaine they've had. So there are, yeah, it, it accounts for some. You, you need to have a lot of cocaine to get to the point where they're compulsive. But even when they've had a lot of cocaine, um, actually, wait, sorry. Not I'm even acute. Back. Not even acute. You're in the current acute. During this part. Uh huh. So these routes, there was nothing systemically different about them. They were all given. Like they all have 80 infusions as their long access period. So I, I don't, I want to look at the paper, but my understanding is that they have the same exposure but at the end. Some of them are compulsive, some of them are not. So it wasn't dose dependent? Yeah. And there's other studies that have shown it's not dose dependent, or it, it doesn't predict it completely. Certainly, if you have an ad, a group that has had very little exposure, there won't be many, any compulsive ones. But the dose is not. There's lots of rats that will take a lot and not be compulsive, similar to people. Yeah. Okay. With regard to the Peter Kalaiva result, um, uh, if you inhibit the prefrontal cortex, you're going to decrease memory. So probably it's just the, 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 the disruption or the relapse will be related to, to a memory impairment. Yeah, I think, or especially in the queue, you have the queue has to you know, enter the brain through sensory regions down surrounding cortex and it can go to striatum or so if you're inhibiting a big chunk of cortex maybe it's just he's no longer responsive to the cue. Yeah. So the last one I'm going to show this is a um, I believe this may be a 2014 I believe this is more recent I may have that wrong. Um, but this is also just to make it even more confusing or kind of, you know, these things that are important to think about with inhibiting or exciting an entire structure, especially something like prefrontal cortex. Um, the, the effects can be complicated, I guess is a good word. So um, in this one, what they're looking at is the, um, the extinction or the reinstatement of either a recent or a remote. Um, so they do a, a conditioning. And then their recent means day one or day two. So following conditioning, they're either going to you know, bring them back for the condition place preference, either with or without the stimulation. And then remote is three weeks later, day 21 or day 22. So we're looking at preference scores. Following the conditioning, um, if you uh, look at, you know, if you look at off, even though it's on day two, this is just showing the cocaine condition place preference. If you stimulate ventral medial prefrontal cortex, all of these, if you get into the histology, are very similar where they're activating. Um, they have slightly different names, but ventral medial is sort of is like prelimbic. So in the recent one, there's no effect of inhibiting on a condition place preference. However, when they inhibit it um, on the, the remote, so three weeks later, they bring them back to condition place preference. Now you have some effect of stimulating channel right absent. It actually seemed to promote an extinction on the, on the second day. So the second day, there's not even any stimulation. They're just like these animals now, because they got it the day before, in this remote context, not recent. 
Um, when they did inhibition, they, did, they ran this a little differently. It was actually the opposite. So they have inhibition. They ran these in two separate ones. For some reason, they didn't just keep these guys running out, maybe because they were already <coughs> extinguishing. But halo rhodopsin will actually, you know, it'll, inhibiting these will extinguish in a recent way and not in a remote. And I feel like it's hard to kind of pull all this together and make, you know, it's three studies and the number of parameters that are different is many, many more than three. Um, so it's hard to pull together, but I think it's kind of nice to think about the, sort of the, the complications of studying a behavior and what you can do with optogenetics when you, you know, stimulate or inhibit the entire structure. So I'm um, going you know, to summarize these that I think the work, the non-optogenetic work is pretty well established that prefrontal cortex is involved in inhibitory control. Um, and then we talked about this compulsive paper that reduces cocaine seeking in compulsive animals. Um, the inhibiting it reduced the, the Q induced um, reinstatement. And then there's something in this time dependent paper that suggests a lot more is going on when you know, the animal is alive for three weeks or four weeks. There's other effects that are going on besides whether you're um, turning this structure on or off. So I'm going to conclude there. I, I feel like I've probably used almost all the time. Um, I thought of some things that we can think about as questions. Um, and these are things that are, um, as far as I know, sort of outstanding in the literature. But um, one of them, we had talked a lot about this reinforcement thing and whether that's the final pathway for dopamine, um, I think is kind of a very interesting question that certainly is sufficient. It doesn't mean it's the only place that's sufficient to promote reinforcement. Um, there's also a role that possibly turning off the negative emotional state can do negative reinforcement. Um, we haven't, they don't seem to learn it in that way, but we could, that doesn't mean that's not the way that dopamine works. So stimulating dopamine and, and inhibiting those cells at the same time or something, maybe that there's negative reinforcement going through here. Um, the other one we brought up a, a bit, all of these of, I keep saying we're like stimulating the whole structure, inhibiting the whole structure. Drugs are, or any behavior, probably acts on a subset of circuits within a, a structure. So there are some ways of getting at this channel rhodopsin wise where people have used um, phosphate strategies to essentially get channel rhodopsin into cells that are, express, that are expressing phos during the behavior. And I feel like this is ideal for drug addiction work. Um, it hasn't been applied to drug addiction work yet, but I think it's ideal for, you know, if you get 10% of accumbal neurons express phos during whatever behavior, why not, you know, just, <coughs> them, just get channel rhodopsin in those neurons and see if you can get a drug, you know, change in drug behavior without changing other behaviors. And then, of course, the timing of the stimulation is, um, it's a little, like, one more level of confusion to throw on when you read through the papers of everybody is using different timing, different stimulation parameters. Um, and I think, I think it will work itself out that people will get more into, you know, doing dose responses and things like that to get, get a handle on you know, what's the relationship between how you make a cell fire and the behavior, not just you know, make it fire as much as we can and see the behavior. Uh, that was, that's awesome. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for your attention. Sorry, say the last part. The, the B1 and B2 uh, dopamine receptor co-expressing uh, uh, sites by your neurons. What do you yeah. think they are doing? So, um, so, yeah, so the question is, what about, I have these expressed as direct pathway expresses a B1, indirect pathway expresses a B2. There's a population that expresses both, uh, mainly in the accumbens shell. So in the dorsal striatum and the accumbens core, um, my simple view, I think is a fair one, that it's probably about 5% of the cells may express both. In the accumbens shell, it's more. It's 15 to 20% will express both. And the cells that express both kind of have properties of both if you look at the projection targets. So my view is that they exist. Um, in some ways, avoided it getting into the accumbens because it's more confusing with them. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone knows what they are, but I, my view is they exist, and they probably have properties of both.
I have kind of a stupid question, completely stupid, but I don't know if you know, in the 60s and maybe early 70s, uh, there was a lot of research going on on the effect of brain stimulation. Guys like Jose Delgado made uh, the news. I just, uh, you can still uh, find the Boo video on YouTube if you look for it. And there was Elliot Wallerstein at Michigan that did a lot of stuff about it. So in some way, this technique is a replay of this old approach in which people were looking at the brain like a network structure more than a, a bunch of receptors. So the question is, are you guys in any way relating to this old literature to see what these new methods bring in compared to what they found without all these fancy techniques? I mean, it's a little bit the same question with knockout. When knockout first came out, in many cases, they just confirmed what pharmacology had shown. And then we had to wait for a long time to get more selective uh, type specific knockout to really see an advantage yeah. to what. So I, I never see in any talk any relationship with to this old literature that is actually pretty extensive Yes. Uh, on uh, how brain stimulation induced behavior even, you know, reward, you have uh, uh, self-brain stimulation, I mean, you yeah, have no, a, 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 a lot of stuff. That's a great point. So that a lot of this is like very related, like the striatum, the bull video that you're referring to is the striatal stimulation, where you would actually freeze a bull yeah. with electrical stimulation to the striatum. Um, and Obviously, the power of doing the optogenetics is that you have many cell types, so now you can do one and find out the freezing was probably in those bulls related to the indirect pathway. Or, I mean, you can get more, but yeah, it's very, I think that's a great, a good point. I should probably, I think it would be good to refer to o this more. O also because, uh, therapeutically, I mean, now that we can do deep brain stimulation in humans in a way that is acceptable, it will be more complicated to do optogenetics. It would be good to know <coughs> if uh, the way in which you access brain activity is essentially, you need essentially to distinguish between different type of neuron in one structure, or if structure has major effect that you sort out stimulating the entire structure. So it's I think it's important to relate to this old literature just because what we can now do in humans is basically what Delgado was doing in uh, Wool a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And so maybe bridging, bridging the gap, it would be very useful. Yeah, that's a great comment. Have you ever tried to perform the same experiment, combine A2A pre-aligned and B2 pre-aligned, you have an idea to which extent uh, cholinergic interneurons can contribute when people use that B2 pre-aligned? Yeah, so the, the question is, um, <coughs> I kind of, um, I've been, a lot of these experiments I showed you were using an A2A pre-aligned, so the adenosine 2A receptor that targets these neurons. You can also use a D2 pre-aligned, um, which targets these neurons, um, but it also targets cholinergic neurons in the striatum. And in terms of the punishment stuff, it doesn't matter. You get the same behavior. But, so we initially um, had the D2 pre-line because the A2A3 was, it was later available. So when I started these experiments, we just had the D2 pre-line. And, and then later on, we got the A2A3 when it became available and same behavior. So I think it's a neat idea to get at the cholinergic role, but um, I think the better, yeah, better would be to use a chat free and then specifically test them. And I haven't done that. I don't know. There's work on that with cocaine reward, but I don't know if anyone's just seen if the chat neurons on their own are reinforcing or not.
Prime Minister, right? 